To whom should we show compassion? To whom should we show consideration? To whom should we show kindness? What, what about the homeless person that you drive by every single day on your way to work? Is that person your neighbor? What about, what about the single mom that, that lives down the street from you? Her kids are kind of wild, but she's trying to raise those kids on her own and support those kids on her own. Is she your neighbor? What about the thousands of orphans that live in Broward County? Are they our neighbor? What about the older couple that lives in your neighborhood and yeah, they don't take care of their house the way they used to and I kind of aggravate you just a little bit, but are, are they your neighbor as well? You see, those are, those are difficult questions. Those are relevant questions that Jesus answers in the passage of Scripture that we are studying today. Would you take your Bibles with me today and turn to Luke chapter 10? Luke chapter 10, we're going through our series that we've titled Investigating Jesus. And I would remind you by way of uh, review that Luke is writing this specifically to a man named Theophilus. And in the process of writing this, his goal is to prove to Theophilus and to us that Jesus is no less than who he claims to be. Jesus is the very Son of God, God in the flesh. And we've seen that illustrated as we walk through this book. Last week we looked at a powerful passage and we saw that, that Jesus has the power over life and death and that Jesus even uses the delays in our life to accomplish his purpose, that he is a sovereign God. And I believe in today's passage, a very well-known passage, Luke once again illustrates and emphasizes the fact that Jesus is the answer for us. Like a good neighbor, like the good neighbor, like the good Samaritan, Jesus is always there. Luke chapter 10, I'll begin reading in verse 25. I'll put it up on the screen. You follow along in your Bible. Verse 25 one day an expert in religious law, your Bible might say a lawyer, he was a lawyer that took the Old Testament law and applied it. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, he says, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Let me pause for a second and say, that might be the most important question that you and I will ever read, or that you and I will ever ask, or that you and I will ever receive an answer to. What must, what should, what do I have to do to receive eternal life? I would remind you that this life is just a temporary existence, and you and I will live beyond this life. Someone has said that we're not really ready to live until we're ready to die, until we know the answer to this question, what must I do, Lord, to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, Jesus replied to this expert of the law, what does the law of Moses say? What does the Old Testament law say? How do you read it? The man responds, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responds, right. Good answer, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. Verse 29 is a different verse. The man, though wanting to justify his actions, asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor? If I'm supposed to reach out and take care of my neighbor, who is my neighbor? Verse 30, Jesus replied with a story. Would you pray with me today? Father, as we look at your word, we, we ask for the insight. We ask for the wisdom, for the inspiration, as it were, of the Holy Spirit of God. 
I pray that you would help us to not only understand the context of this passage, I pray you'd understand, help us to understand how it applies to this young man who asked this question, but even more importantly, I pray that you'd help us this morning to understand how it applies to us. Father, help us to realize this morning how very much we need Jesus. And not only how much we need Jesus, but how important it is for us to be Jesus in our community. For us to be a good neighbor. For us to be just like the good Samaritan. So God, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would take the word of God and remind us of the truth of this passage today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in response to this man's question, who is my neighbor? Jesus simply tells a story. Here's the story that he tells. A Jewish man was traveling from the city of Jerusalem down to the city of Jericho. Now, now that was not a safe trip. It, it was a dangerous 17-mile journey downhill that was filled with narrow and rocky passages and frightening cliffs that plunged 300 to 400 feet down into deep crevices. This road was notorious for being unsafe. It was it was dangerous for three reasons. It was dangerous, first of all, because if you weren't careful, you could fall off one of those cliffs and obviously fall to your death. It was dangerous because it was isolated and barren. When you walked that 17-mile journey, often you were by yourself. It was dangerous because all of the caves and rocks gave perfect places for thieves and thugs to hide. Well, as you can imagine, that's exactly what took place to this Jewish man. He, he was attacked by bandits. He was, he was stripped naked. He was beaten. And then he was left by the side of the road to die. As this man lay there, no doubt going in and out of consciousness, I'm, I'm sure he wondered, will anyone help me? Will I be attacked by, by wild animals? Is this it? Is this the way I'm going to die here all alone on an isolated, desolate road? Well, it just happened that not long after the attack, a Jewish priest was walking along that same road. As the Jewish priest approached the place where the man was attacked, he saw something lying beside the side of the road. He wasn't sure what it was. Is that a dead animal? He thought... To his dismay, you quickly realize, though, that it wasn't a dead man animal, but a man and a badly beaten one at that. The priest was uncertain what he should do. His priestly instincts told him that he should reach out and help the man, but there were too many uncertainties. Why? What if this was a trap? What if, what if the thieves were still hiding behind the rocks and the crevices and they were just waiting for somebody like me to come along and they would jump on me just like they jumped on this man? What if, what if the man's dead? Why, why, that would create a whole new dilemma. I'm a priest and I can't defile myself with a dead body. That would limit my ministry. So instead of helping the man... He quickly and cautiously walked to the other side of the road. Certainly someone else will come along soon, he thought. Certainly someone else will come along who can help him much better than I can. And so he went on his way, convincing himself that he did the right thing. Meanwhile, the beaten man wasn't getting any better he continues to lose blood, and quite frankly, if someone doesn't help him soon, he just might die there on the side of the road. Fortunately, here comes a second traveler. This traveler is traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. He also works in the temple. He's not a priest. He's a Levite. Although he doesn't have the title or the pedigree of the priest, he's still a respected religious leader. Unlike the priest, though, the Levite hears the wounded man before he sees him. 
At first he's uncertain where where the groans are coming from. And and then he sees the man lying ahead of him in a pool of blood. He walks up to the man and looks down on him. The man's eyes are closed. His face is bruised, bloody, and swollen. For a few moments, Jesus says that he just stands there and, and looks at the man, uncertain what he should do. He's a logical thinker, and all of a sudden, options begin to race through his mind. Why? He thinks, I could pick up the man, and I I could carry him back to Jerusalem. But that's a five-mile hike, and it's uphill all the way. And not only that, but if I carry him back to Jerusalem, what am I going to do when I get there? My, My shift in the temple begins in just a few hours I just don't have the time to deal with this. And with that, he too walks to the other side of the road and leaves the man alone. The wounded man begins to lose hope, as you and I would. Why, if a priest and a Levite won't help me, what are the odds that anyone else will have compassion on me? Fortunately, there's a third traveler that's traveling along that desolate road. This man isn't a priest, nor is he a Levite. As a matter of fact, he's not even Jewish. This man is a Samaritan. Now, now that might not mean much to you and I, but it would have been very significant to the people of Jesus' day. You see, the Samaritans were extremely disliked by the Jews. In the passage, Jesus calls him a despised Samaritan. The Samaritans were considered the scum of the earth. As a matter of fact, if you lived during that time and you walked in the temple and you participated in the prayers of the temple and in the prayers of the synagogue, you would have heard devout Jews praying every day that the Samaritans would not receive eternal life. As a matter of fact, Jews often prayed that they would get their due punishment in hell. That's what they deserve. Well, of all people, it was the despised Samaritan that had compassion on the wounded traveler. Upon seeing the man lying uh, alongside the road, he, he immediately runs up to him. It didn't take him long to realize that this man was sick. And quite frankly, he realized that he wasn't a Samaritan, that he was a Jew, but that didn't matter The only thing that mattered now was that this man was hurt and that he desperately needed help. Are you alive, he says. Can can you hear me? Grabbing some olive oil and, and wine from his bag, he treats the traveler's cuts and bruises slowly and carefully. He lifts the man onto his donkey and begins the tedious journey to the nearest inn. You can only imagine what was going through the traveler's mind. I'm not going to die. Why why somebody has rescued me. Why a Samaritan though? Why would the Samaritan care? Possibly reading his thoughts, the Samaritan compassionately assures him, don't worry, don't fret, we'll get you to safety. Arriving at the end, Jesus says, the Samaritan pays for a room, buys food, and begins to nurse the wounded traveler back to good health. Although the demands of his journey necessitated that he continue on to his destination, he told the wounded man, I must go, but I want you to stay here as long as it takes for you to get better. Why, I'm leaving two silver coins with the innkeeper. And if you incur any additional expenses, well, I will pay for them when I return. How many of you have heard that story before? That's the story of the good Samaritan. That's the story that Jesus told whenever the man asked, how can I inherit eternal life? And then as Jesus converses with him, The man trying to justify himself says, who is my neighbor? Let me just give you a a few brief facts about a parable and this parable 
A parable, just in case you didn't know, is a short allegorical story designed to illustrate or teach some truth, some religious principle, or a moral lesson. Jesus used them repeatedly throughout the New Testament as he taught spiritual truth. This parable is only found in the book of Luke. You won't find it in Matthew or Mark or John. As we've illustrated this morning, this parable is one of the most well-known and one of the most loved parables in all of the Bible. I remember hearing this parable when I was probably two or three years old for the very first time, hearing a teacher with flannel graph, remember flannel graph, illustrate this parable. This parable highlights several things. It highlights man's sinful condition. It highlights, I believe, Jesus' impartial compassion. And I believe it highlights the believer's mission as well. I would remind you that this parable was given in response to the question of the expert in religious law. And so as Jesus turns to him and he he tells him this story, what is the message that Jesus wanted this man to grasp a hold of? What is the message For you and me, what are the lessons that we can learn from this all-familiar parable today? I pulled out three or four things in your notes. Notice with me, first of all, the first thing that I believe we can learn is this. You and I can never be good enough. Catch that. Wrap your mind around that truth. We can never be good enough. You see, this young man was a good man. Uh, The text doesn't say, but I would seriously doubt that he had a criminal record. He probably was squeaky clean. He probably was raised in a Christian home. He probably began to learn the Old Testament law from his youth. This guy knew the Bible. He knew what the Bible teaches. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because when Jesus asks him, what does the law say? He immediately, without hesitation, quotes two verses. The first verse that he quotes is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, which is called the Shema, what every uh, a Jewish male learned when they were young. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, and you should worship the Lord your God with all of your hearts, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, without hesitation, he quotes that verse. But if that were not enough, he joins with Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18, a verse which ends saying, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. You see, This gentleman demonstrated that he had biblical knowledge. He not only demonstrated that he had biblical knowledge, but he demonstrated that he had biblical understanding because he could take those Old Testament verses and he could apply them to his life. This man knew what the Bible teaches. Let me pause for just a second and say this. Knowing what the Bible says is not enough. Being able to quote scripture verses is not enough. This man knew the Bible, but in his case, it was not enough. You see, the second thing that we see is this guy not only knew what the Bible teaches, but he was convicted by the truth. I love the simplicity and yet the candor of Jesus' response. After the man quotes these two verses, Jesus is, man, simple and straight to the point. Right, Jesus says. Good answer, he says. Now go and do it, and you will live. I'm surprised by the man's response. I would have thought that the man, after receiving Jesus' words, would have said, great, (laughs) all right, if it's that simple, that's what I've been doing. And he'd have walked away feeling good about himself. Or I would have maybe expected him to say, okay, Jesus, I got it. I'm going to begin to put that into practice in my life. But that's not how the man responds. His response is defensive. It demonstrates that he was convicted by the truth. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? He knew as he quoted those verses, 
he knew that he was unable to perfectly live them out. And instead of embracing his inability to fully live out Jesus' commands, he tried to excuse it. But Jesus, I know that's what the Bible says. But who is my neighbor anyways? Trying to excuse his actions. Let me pause there for a second and say, we do that too sometimes. Do we not? Have you ever heard or read something in Scripture and you were convicted by it, and instead of responding to it, a defense mechanism clicked in in your life? Well, that's right, and I would do that, but... Man, you know what? I know the Bible says that I shouldn't forsake assembling myself with other believers, but, man, life is hectic, and who can attend church every Sunday anyways? And, Brian, I know the Bible says that I should give, but, man, the budget is tight, and we begin to throw out excuses just like this man did trying our best to justify our actions here's what this man realizes and i believe with all of my heart what jesus is the truth that jesus is conveying to this man is this you can never know the bible well enough you can never change enough you can never be obedient enough You can never serve enough. You can never be good enough. There's nothing that you can do to justify yourself. The simple truth is this. We need Jesus. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. There is no one righteous. No, not one. You're a smart crowd. What does the word no one mean? No one. Nadie. Zilch. Nobody. Nobody righteous. No, not one. I love how it's said in Spanish. Ni siquiera uno. Not even one. You see, there's not a single person that can live good enough, that can know their Bible good enough, that can attend church enough, that can serve enough, No one is good enough. Let me pause this morning and say, if you're here today and you are depending upon your righteousness, if you're depending upon your knowledge, if you're depending upon your good works, if you're depending upon your goodness, your kindness, it's never good enough. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that I can do to make us inherit or earn eternal life. It is all about Jesus. And so as Jesus talks to this man and he asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer very simply is this, there's nothing that you can do in and of yourself. And then he tells him a story. The second point that I pull from it is this, Before coming to Jesus, you were like the beaten traveler. Let me pause for a second and say, I know this is a little bit of a non-traditional way to support this passage. But but I believe that, that the character that we most relate to in the story is not the priest, it's not the Levite, it's certainly not the Good Samaritan. The character with whom we most relate in the story is the beaten traveler. Let let me put it in context because remember the man came to Jesus and he asked him a vertical question. He didn't ask him a horizontal question. The question he asked him was, okay, Jesus, what may... He didn't say, what must I do to treat my neighbor well? That wasn't the question he asked. That would have been a horizontal question. He asked Jesus a vertical question. And the vertical question is this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what must I do to be right with God? The lawyer was, after all, seeking to justify himself, to justify his actions. This parable must then be interpreted not only horizontally, but this parable must also be interpreted vertically. Jesus is talking about justification. He's not talking about sanctification in the passage. 
You see, here's the idea. Man has the idea to think that he's okay without God. But here's the idea. Any man without Jesus is in extreme danger. And if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you are trying your best to live it and make it on your own, be assured of the fact this morning that you are in danger. Looking at the passage, we see several things. Like this beaten traveler, you have been beaten and bruised by your enemy. Think with me today, it all began in the Garden of Eden where a spiritual thug named the devil attacked Adam and Eve. And there in the Garden of Eden, he, he robbed them of their innocence. He stripped them naked and left them for dead. For thousands of years, that brutal crime has been committed over and over and over again. As a matter of fact, this morning, all of us are victims of such a beating. We've been beaten, and we were left for dead in our sins. You see, the Apostle Paul speaking to the Ephesians who had already trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, he says, but you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. Before we come to Christ, it's not that we are dying spiritually. We are already dead. If you're here this morning and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a Baptist, if you're a Methodist, if you're a Catholic, if you're a Lutheran, whatever you are, if you're here today and you have not given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, like this traveler, you are dying, you are dead in your sins. And we see a third analogy. Like this traveler, we're helpless. And we are in desperate need of somebody to rescue us. I love the words of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 and verse 6 where he says all we like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own way. What's the idea? Man we ambled off of the path. We're lost. We're confused. We need someone to rescue us. That brings me to my third point in the message. The third point is this. Jesus comes to the rescue. Uh, Quite frankly, I I admit we've we've struggled with this passage all week long. Jose and I have spent a lot of time talking about it, a lot of time praying about it, a lot of time researching it. We certainly don't want to be loosey and goosey, if I can use that with the text. All right, I don't know where that term came from. I don't know if I made that up or not, but we simply don't want to be easy with the text. It's our job not to tell you what we think the text says, but it's our job to tell you what the text says. And we've struggled with that all week long. We've struggled answering the question, who is the Good Samaritan? Is the Good Samaritan you? Is the Good Samaritan me? Can we ever be good enough. We've wrestled with that all week long, and the only person that we could find that fulfills the characteristics of the Good Samaritan is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Good Samaritan that comes to our rescue. Let me show you the analogy. First of all, like the Good Samaritan, Jesus has compassion on you. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Nine times in the New Testament, Jesus is moved with compassion because of man's condition. Over and over again, as Jesus sees man lost, he sees him beaten, he sees him bruised, he sees him headed towards the wrong path. Instead of responding with with justifiable anger, Jesus Jesus always responds with compassion. Whether you realize it this morning or not, Jesus has compassion on you. It doesn't matter whether you reciprocate his love or not. It doesn't matter whether you respond to him or not. God loves you. And he shows compassion on us. Like the Good Samaritan, Jesus heals our wounds. Here's a great verse, Psalm 147 and verse 3. He heals 
the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. One of the things in ministry is we're constantly dealing with wounded people. People who, who, who are experiencing wounds that are often self-inflicted. People who are experiencing wounds that are inflicted by others. And, and people who are experiencing a life that has just, quite frankly, beaten them up. And they come here looking for something. They don't know what they're looking for, but they come here looking for something. And the only thing that we have to offer them is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus heals the brokenhearted. Jesus takes those wounds and he puts the salve of the Word of God and of the Holy Spirit of God on them. He is the balm of Gilead. He is the salve that heals a wounded heart. You hear this morning and you're wounded, you're beaten, you're bruised. Let me encourage you, turn to Jesus. Jesus heals the wounds. Like the good Samaritan, Jesus paid your debt. Oh, I love this analogy in the story. The good Samaritan takes two silver coins from his bag and he leaves them with the innkeeper and he says, listen, this is not only to pay the expenses that he has incurred, but I want to cover any expense that he has from here forward. I want to pay his debts. What a beautiful illustration of what Jesus Christ has done for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, Paul says, For God bought you with a high price. We sing this song on a regular basis. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. You see, Jesus paid the debt for all of our sins. Here's a fourth analogy that we drew from the text is this. Like the good Samaritan, Jesus is coming back for you. The good Samaritan says this. He says, listen, I'm going to cover your expenses now, but, but don't worry. I am coming back. And I'm coming back and I'm going to take care of everything that needs to be taken care of. I'm not going to leave you alone. I am willing to come back for you. Well, that's exactly what Jesus has told us. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you to myself, that where I am there you will be also. And here's the truth today. Jesus has come to our rescue. Let me ask you this morning, have you been rescued by Jesus Christ? Was there a time in your life when you realized that there was nothing that you could do? You were beaten and bruised by sin and you realized that your only hope, your only escape, your only rescue was Jesus. And you turned to Jesus and he healed your life. He rescued you. I'm so grateful that Jesus comes to the rescue. You see, I believe there's a vertical interpretation in the passage. Not only is there a vertical interpretation, but I believe there's a horizontal interpretation as well. We didn't read the story. I, I told the story today, but notice when you come to verse 36, as Jesus ends the story, he turns to the expert in religious law and he says, now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And so this man's trying to understand the story and rationalize it and come to some sort of a conclusion. I think it's really interesting. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy, he couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan because they so despised the Samaritans. But he said, why? The right answer is the one who showed mercy. Here's what Jesus says then. Jesus says, yes, now you go and do the exact same thing. 
Please, man, we need to make sure that we, uh, that we qualify and clarify that Jesus is not saying that we're rescued from our sinful condition by doing good works. What Jesus is saying is after we have been rescued, our job is to what? Our job is to be Jesus to a lost and dying world. Our job is to be a good neighbor to someone who needs it. Our job is to be a good Samaritan and be involved involved in the rescue just as Jesus rescued us you see it's interesting that the lawyer asked the question who is my neighbor but Jesus never answered that question rather Jesus changes the wording of the question and he asks him are you a good neighbor you see the correct question is not who is my neighbor the correct question is are you, am I, a good neighbor? You see, we began the message asking the question, who is your neighbor? To whom do we have the responsibility to be kind, compassionate, loving, and generous? To whom should we show the love of Jesus Christ? And here's the answer. This is deep. This is profound. The answer is this, to everyone. To everyone, not only to those that we love, not only to those that we like, but we should be Jesus even to those that we may despise, even to those who may despise us. You see, it was the Good Samaritan who reached out to someone that despised him. He could have very easily justified his actions by thinking, that man doesn't give a flip about me, I'm not going to care about him either. But he reached out to somebody who despised him. He reached out to someone who even hated him and demonstrated the love of God, demonstrated the love of Jesus Christ to everyone. You see, in other words, this morning, you and I are to be like Jesus. You and I are to have compassion. You and I are to reach out to the hurting. You and I are to rescue them from danger, both physical and spiritual. We are commissioned to be a good neighbor, just like Jesus. We're called to be Jesus to everyone. Our job is to reach out to the less fortunate. Our job is to love the unlovely. Our job is to be Jesus to our community. Here's a great verse in 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. You see, in other words, because we have received the rescue and the love of the good Samaritan, Jesus Christ, you and I should reciprocate that love. We should be good neighbors. We should be good Samaritans to others. We should be like Jesus. I was so proud of our young people yesterday. For the last few weeks, Brad has been taking our young people out doing service projects, teaching them that, you know, Christianity is to be put into action. And yesterday, they just went out into our community, randomly knocked on the doors of six homes in our community, didn't have any idea who those people were, and cut their grass, worked on their yards, did all of that. I think we have a couple of pictures of them out there working. This is our young people being Jesus in our community community. Can you imagine six young people showing up on your door? What are you here for? We want to cut your grass. How much are you going to charge? Nothing. What? How much are you going to charge? Nothing. They were out in the community being Jesus to our community. And you can talk to Brad and the young people. They were blown away. They were blown away by the fact that anyone would do that. Here's a great video. We partner with an organization called His House Ministries that reaches out to the orphan and the less fortunate. Here's a video about their ministry I want you to see this morning. It's not that we don't see the need. How could we miss it? We watch the news. We read the paper. 
we see their faces. There are children in crisis, abused, neglected, forgotten. Once sons and daughters, they now, by no doing of their own, find themselves fatherless. And it's not that we don't know what God has to say about this. God defends the weak. He rescues the needy. He says, I will not leave you alone. I will come to you. He tells us he is a father to the fatherless. But how? How does he defend the weak? How does he rescue the needy? How does Almighty God reach down to be a father to the fatherless? Scripture tells us this. God sets the lonely in families. See, he's had a plan all along. From the very beginning, God's plan for the abused, the neglected, and the forgotten is you. You are his plan for defending the weak. You are his plan for rescuing the needy. You are the family. You and I have not only the privilege of extending the reach of God's family, but we have the responsibility. If we call him father, how could we ignore the needs of his children? So this time, don't let this story be about them. Let it be about you. God is their father. We are their family. His house. Hey, they made a... By the way, Lourdes Aguirre is in back. She works for his house. If you're looking for a place to minister and to be Jesus, we would encourage you to partner with them. She has information on their ministry in the back. They ask a great question. Whose job is it to minister to the abused? Whose job is it to reach out to the broken? Whose job is it to love the rejected and the unlovely? It's your job and it's mine. For we have been called to be Jesus in our community. We have been called to respond like the good Samaritan, to respond like Jesus.